What's good everybody, EDM Adam here. Welcome back to the channel. If you're new here, I do weekly reaction videos as well as now festival coverage and occasionally album reviews. If you're a fan of EDM, strictly for the music, festivals, or anything else, I recommend subscribing. Wanted to go really in depth for this festival review, so I'm gonna be doing everything from stage production, uh, venue logistics, food and beverage. Might even talk about the air quality because for my asthmatic festival goers, sometimes that matters. Also wanna mention, a lot of this footage was uh, courtesy of Cotton Candy, if you're familiar with her. Gonna break down what that VIP experience is like and whether or not it's worth it. Also want to announce, I'm gonna be a contributor at ravescouts.com. So this is a new collective of just EDM loving individuals from all around the world, actually. The website just went live recently. Um, one of the cool features on there is the festival calendar among plenty of other resources. So feel free to check that out. I'll put that in the description. Um, lots to jump into for this festival review. Let's get into it. So starting with the festival layout, uh, main stage. Took me to the end of day one to realize it's actually supposed to be like a castle. Production quality's there, I just wasn't crazy about the shape of it, felt a little clunky. Um, but overall, you know, no major complaints. Siberian stage. This was actually my favorite of the festival. Cool thing about this stage is that this is actually a pre-existing um, kind of like amphitheater, if you will. It's on, it's kind of on a slant, um, so like theater style. I just prefer the design to this stage as well with that kind of like inverted square. It just made for like a really cool production and a lot of clean, crisp imaging. Whereas the LED screens on the main stage, uh, the forbidden stage, were, were just kind of like split. And sometimes you didn't always get the clearest image, but we're splitting hairs. So the mystic stage was basically a big tent with a pretty solid stage underneath it. Uh, LEDs were there. At some points it felt a little small considering that was the disciple takeover and there were some pretty big acts there. And finally, the best kept secret of the festival, this hidden gem. Doesn't look like much from the outside. We have the village. This was an air conditioned warehouse. Immediately when you walk in, it being a warehouse, you kind of get like those old school European rave style vibes. Um, not that I've been to those, but you know, that's just kind of what Europe's known for. Yeah, it was, it was really cool on day one with this stage being so inconspicuous. Uh, there was not a line to get in because the lines were pretty long to get in on day two. But on day one, it was nice and cool in there. The AC was working. And then I guess day two, something happened with the AC or there was just too many people and it overwhelmed the uh, ability to cool the air in there. But a lot of, a lot of good drum and bass acts there. Uh, 1991 was one of my favorites of the whole entire weekend. There's actually a bar in there which was nice so you didn't have to like exit to go get drinks. This was another thing I wanted to touch on. I thought food and beverage was pretty abundant everywhere but we'll get into that in a minute. And then finally you have this final art installation stage. I think there was inadvertently called the dragon stage but I'm not sure. I didn't spend a ton of time there. Your typical kind of low budget art installation stage. That's just kind of for a change of pace and you might stop by for a couple songs, um, see some underappreciated acts or some up and coming artists. Now I wanted to break down the VIP experience. Uh, so this was really cool. My first time doing VIP at a festival. Um, I can tell you right now when you're in the Florida heat in the middle of summer and it's 97 degrees out, having air-conditioned bathrooms might be worth the VIP experience alone. It would not be rare for people to just be chilling in there, having conversations for like 20 minutes at a time just because it was so hot. Um, overall, the VIP experience is great. You know, no lines for food or water. Having your own water station was clutch. Um, as is typical with most VIP experiences, you kind of have like this side view of the main stage, uh, which you actually can get to the rail. You're just not, you know, directly facing forward. So it's a bit of an awkward angle. You can pretty much get up to the rail without having to fight off a large crowd of people. And overall, it's just nice to have like a spot to chill um, that's just not super crowded, right? I think that's something I noticed uh, as my first time going in there is like, you, you don't really realize it because you're just, you know, in a mass of people all day. But when you get a moment to kind of step away from the chaos and it's a little more chill um, and you have kind of your own space to breathe and, you know, get your, get your whereabouts and 
get whatever you need, water, food, whatever, what have you. It's nice to just kind of have that little bit of space. I at least appreciated that. There was also VIP concierge. So as you can see, um, there's VIP at both the main stage and Siberian, those being the two primary stages of the festival. The VIP uh, section on Siberian was actually a lot cooler. Um, they had swings, which were cool, but I was low-key a little nervous about like an alligator snatching you because it was right next to the water, and this is Florida. But again, uh, had food vendors, had a private bar, um, private bathrooms on the Siberian stage as well. Cool part about the Siberian VIP section is that there was kind of those, those make-your-own candy tables, as you might have seen from other Insomniac events or other festivals so if you wanted to take a breather and create some candy although it could be time consuming you could sit down and do that but yeah in regards to the VIP experience I definitely recommend it um, if you're willing to splurge it is an added benefit to have you know that the private bathrooms not having to wait in line for food or drink um, that kind of takes the general anxiety out of oh I got to squeeze this in in between this set that kind of takes that away makes the festival a little more relaxed, a little less uh, fast paced, if you will. But it can be pretty pricey, especially if you're doing a destination festival like myself, where you're flying in, getting a hotel, and paying for the tickets. So, you know, if your budget can afford it, if you can find a way to get them, but um, all depends with what you're willing to spend. All right, let's jump into the nitty gritty of the festivals. It being an Insomniac event was a one. You have the lasers, you have the LED lights, Nothing left to be desired really in terms of stage production and that was both at main stage and Siberian. Um, both of those uh, had, you know, lasers, LEDs, the whole thing. Lineup and value. So, you know, many people were looking at this lineup long before the festival. Uh, one of the better value lineups of the year. Essentially a miniature Lost Lands, right? It's two days, it's condensed. For the most part, if you were not gonna do Lost Lands, this would be a good one to check off. Um, I've heard this also referred to via Twitter as the Dubstep Met Gala. Uh, love that, that, that needs to be the, the new name for it going forward. Venue itself, uh, was really happy with this one. Um, really easy to navigate, really wide open. It being at the Orlando Fairgrounds there. Um, you know, this is a place that's meant for, you know, big gatherings. Uh, I thought the way they laid it out was pretty easy to navigate. Wasn't too much stage bleed in between, you know, unless you were sitting in really like the center of the festival, you weren't really catching um, noise from any of the other stages. Stage capacity, let's talk about that. So main stage, obviously no issues with stage capacity, uh, plenty of room there. Um, Siberian, stage capacity wasn't a thing, but getting in and out was kind of weird because you had like these two stairways on either the back side or the right side and they weren't really wide enough and so it kind of created a bottleneck in trying to get up there um, just during set transitions and like late at night when you have like the main uh, acts like Subtronics. Uh, it was a little chaotic, but you know, that's a pre-existing structure, so not much they can do with that. Um, stage capacity at Mystic was okay. Like I said, it's a smaller tent, and you know, with Barely Alive and some bigger acts being there later in the day, it got kind of crowded. You kind of had to be outside of the tent at some point. The Village, like I said, day two, it got pretty packed because people were like, oh, this is inside, and this is a stage, and it has AC. So there was no lines on day one, as far as I remember, but day two got pretty crowded. Prices on food and beverage. I tried to get a little snapshot of that. Um, let's just say inflation has definitely hit music festivals. You're paying about 18 bucks for a beer um, and then mixed drinks. If you're bothering with those, it can get pretty pricey, but you're at a music festival, you kind of expect that already. In terms of food and beverage across the festival, uh, lines were short because there were so many options. Uh, again, another mark of an Insomniac event wasn't a shortage of options there. Cell service, one of the underrated things to consider at a festival, especially if you're trying to get an Uber home or you didn't coordinate correctly trying to get out of there. Um, it was actually not awful. It was spotty. You could get a call or a text through if you needed to. Um, you know, it was inconsistent as most music festivals are, but it wasn't a total dead zone as I've experienced at some of the bigger ones, EDC Orlando, um, you know, EDC Vegas. Not that I've been to that one, but I know that there's basically no cell service at all. You could get texts and a few things through, just depended where you were. And as I've mentioned, weather and the time of year, um, it being early May uh, in Florida heat, uh, 97 degrees on the first day, and I think it was a little cooler, like high 80s second day. I personally love the heat, so I don't mind it. I tolerate that well. Um, but even myself, uh, if you don't eat right, you don't sleep well, 
uh, it takes a toll on you. I think we went and chilled at the village stage uh, during like peak heat on day two because it was just so, so exhausting. Um, so something to keep in mind if you don't tolerate heat well, but um, that's not really going to stop most of you wooks getting out there anyways. In terms of logistics in getting to the festival and getting out, uh, getting in was surprisingly easy. Uh, not long lines even for GA uh, getting into the festival. I know the first day there was people wrapped around the corner um, waiting at will call thinking that was how they got into GA. That was not the case on day two. Um, but yeah, not, not super bad issues getting through security. It was pretty quick and easy. However, getting out, as is in most festivals, every once in a while you get one that's got good logistics on getting out of there, but getting out was a nightmare. You're kind of in a rougher area of the suburbs of Orlando, if we want to even call them suburbs. Um, getting in and out of there was pretty difficult. Ubers were a nightmare, even if you left a half an hour early. Um, so definitely plan ahead, see if you can find somebody local with a ride because um, getting out of there was chaotic. And then finally, let's talk about one of the less tangible, kind of just something you perceive, uh, the vibes. For somebody who hasn't been to this festival and is admittedly not the biggest wook, uh, I'm more into the melodic stuff, but I appreciate everything. Um, I expected it to be a little more of an aggressive, you know, like, Lost Lands type vibe, but it was your pretty much standard festival. Obviously the, the lineup was primarily bass music, but no bad vibes all around. People were pretty courteous. Um, you know, Plur was definitely in the atmosphere despite the violence of bass music dropping in the background. There were definitely mosh pits where people got fucked up, but uh, you don't go into that not expecting to catch some elbows. So I personally didn't catch any bad vibes. Um, you know, I'm sure it varies for everybody, but overall solid festival, no complaints. Um, Definitely one that probably should only be two days in that kind of temperature and heat, but if you're a bass music fan, you know, and you can't make it to Lost Lands, uh, Forbidden Kingdom is definitely the spot to be. Anyways, I hope you guys enjoyed this review. Hope it was informative. Hope you found it helpful. Let me know in the comments if there's anything I missed or anything you'd like to see in future videos. I'll probably be doing this for future festivals I attend. Um, as I like for people to be, you know, informed and kind of know what they're getting into. So yeah. Let me know in the comments. Thanks so much for watching. Don't forget to subscribe, and I'll see y'all soon. Hands up, Orlando! Fuck work today!